In terms of the really most elaborate burials that we have from the late Iron Age around Colchester Camelodunum, Lexton is the one that springs out, dating to the end of the first century BC. The Lexton tumulus is actually the perfect example of the, the kinds of elites that we get in Colchester in particular, and these burials that are very distinctive to this region, uh, and, and how they reflect on that communication between the local elites and the Roman world. And it was this vast tumulus, and it's kind of almost like a Bronze Age style. It's quite unusual from that point of view, with a chambered tomb inside. It's been interpreted as not just a local elite, but potentially even a, a late Iron Age king in the region. And then it's the sheer quantity of objects that makes it so important, and the type of objects too. It has the what we call Dressel 1 Amphora, which is coming from northern Italy, which contained wine. It has a range of other impressive gave goods, things like mail, armour, but also things like the Augusta Medallion. So the Augustus Medallion is one of the most incredible objects, um, in my opinion, that we have in the collection, but even from Iron Age, late Iron Age Britain. So the medallion is actually adapted from a silver denarius with the face of Augustus on it, and it's adapted in a way to really highlight the face of the emperor. What you're seeing there is a Roman emperor in a first century BC burial. You know, what on earth is that face doing there, really, in that context? And that's, for me, is the most fascinating kind of aspect. Would the person buried in there have recognised that as an emperor? What would that have meant to him? Would he have known the emperor even, you know, or, or at least his ambassadors? One really clear thing always to say is that the type of Roman metalworking is very distinctive and would have been distinctive in the region at the time. So people would have known it was foreign from just looking at it. Even if you didn't know that is Augustus, you know that this is an incredible object that comes from far away. It certainly isn't local. So it already draws that, that kind of idea of uh, opulence and, and uh, incredible wealth. But also, we know that these late Iron Age kings were very aware of the Roman world and had interactions and had communications. I mean, we even know some of them travelled, met with Romans. So there would have been diplomacy with a war leader, let's say, and his son may have actually gone back with the Romans to the Empire, even to Rome, to be brought up as a Roman, in effect, and then returned to his tribe many years later and gone back to his culture with all, all of the, the Roman knowledge he's come back with and may have even become a real fan of what the Romans had to offer, if you like, and brought that back to his previous culture. You see that in the Lexton Tumulus very strongly, is the wealth of Roman objects. So the Augustus Medallion might represent a, a bit of that diplomacy, a bit of that connection with the Roman Empire. But that's not the only Roman artefact either. You've got this wonderful, what seems to be from a folding chair, this little tiny foot and then these little figurines, probably from, from uh, furniture as well, so you've got a griffin. Probably wouldn't have been recognisable as, as something to Iron Age people. So again, what that would have meant to Iron Age people is hard to say. Probably not an awful lot, but would it need to? And in a way with the ambiguity of something like a griffin, you know, add to its exoticism and, and, and power, if you like. A boar would be very recognisable. I mean, you see that on, on coins and on shields and things like that. So boars were, really were a symbol to, to Iron Age peoples of strength or, or, or assumingly some kind of totemic power. But the sheer wealth of all those artefacts put it together means that uh, you must have had something very important there. And, and you know, people have kind of tried to put that to an individual, to a king, possibly even a, a, a king of the Trinovante, so prior to the Cataflorni, who, who knows. So in terms of what we have that compares with the burials that we have at Colchester, perhaps the real best comparison is Folly Lane, which is a burial overlooking the centre at Verulamium in Hertfordshire. That too is in a wooden chamber, that too had imports from the Roman world. It also has things like mail, um, armour, so also showing perhaps their prowess in warfare. So other examples do exist. In other complexes we don't know so much about them. Perhaps. Colchester Camelodunum is different in terms of the, the quality and the range that we have compared to other centres. We know that there was a huge amount of contact between late Iron Age Britain and, and the continent. Um, very often people talk about the Roman arrival into Britain and it's a bit of a misnomer and a bit misleading because actually there's, there's a huge amount of Roman material and, and contact between the two. We have a lot of ancient sources that mention that. Strabo talks about in the first century BC, the kind of things that are being imported from Britain. So these are things like grain, hunting dogs, slaves, for instance. 
And also there's the more intangible kind of trade, trade of ideas and practices. So there's a huge impact in the late Iron Age of what's going on in the continent in Britain from changes in funerary practices, metalworking, pottery making and other technologies that are developing and learning, but also, you know, being introduced. So places like Colchester that we see emerging in the late Iron Age, we often saw the development of those sites as being in controlling trade with especially the Roman Empire because those are the places where we see the Roman imports like the wine amphora. It's hard to know to what extent their role is controlling trade or whether it's about these are power centres to where trade and exchange and interaction with the Roman Empire takes place. So it may be that these centres are already emerging and they are the place that Roman traders come to, they are the place where Roman elites come to, to they give gifts to um, the rulers, the leaders of those centres, but to what extent they were actually centres for trade is a little bit difficult to ascertain because we don't really have enough evidence for large-scale trade and that is one of the differences within the centre in the late Iron Age Britain from somewhere like late Iron Age Gaul. So if we go to some of the centres in central France for instance we have thousands and thousands of amphora being imported from northern Italy. We don't have that kind of scale of material being imported into southern Britain, which suggests that the relationship is somewhat different. Of course, we've always got to remember that archaeologically speaking, a lot of things that might be being traded and exchanged just won't survive archaeologically. Welcome to the History Hit YouTube channel, which we are relaunching. We've got all the best exclusive content going straight onto this History Hit YouTube channel. And you can find out, for example, why on earth I'm standing at the top of this mast. You should probably subscribe.